Hello and welcome, my partner's in crime, and I say that in the nicest possible way, you know, um, I just love it actually. Listen, I have to apologise actually for the 17th of March. Um, it was the day, or the day before I was doing the um, Lennon murder, and um, I had absolutely terrible issues with Premiere Pro editing stuff, so the whole of that day was taken up um, with other things. Now, being half Irish myself, um, I really need to apologise that I didn't say anything, or put up a post or say anything about um, St Patrick's Day. So everyone, I know it's you know late, so belated, happy St Patrick's Day, and soon when we're all out of this lockdown as we are, um, I will be celebrating that, uh, probably along with many others that will be out on that day celebrating. So I really like to apologise for that. Okay, let's get straight on to this case. Now this case. It's the case of the Clydic murders. And again, I'm going to apologise for my accent and, um, you know, how I pronounce things because this is just the way I am. I have lots of different accents in here, London, Irish, you know, Australian, and it's all going on. Uh, and Welsh is not one of them, um, any language that I speak. And everyone knows that I go to Wales a lot. I absolutely love Wales. I love the Welsh people. Um, I love them and I'm always in Carmarthen and I'm always in and I'm so happy they've reopened actually. Um, I'm always in um, the old courthouse cafe there which I absolutely love every time I go. So I really apologise if any of my pronunciations in this video, um, I don't really mean to be you know, um, you know, disrespectful to anybody. So I hope you um, think that's okay. So just bear with me on some of the the pronunciations of that. So listen, this is the Clydic murder case. Um, it is about a murder of this, you know, generation, three generations of um, people in one home. And this case is um, a shocking case for many reasons. One, because I've already stated that it wasn't just a murder, it's like a massacre in this house of what happened to these people. And I don't mean any disrespect when I speak about any of the people that have passed away any of the victims I would usually do everything I can not to say anything about victims in any derogatory way at all and so there's no offence should be taken but when you're looking into a case especially a case that may be a miscarriage of justice and has has really has you know questions really it's questionable this conviction here really um, I think we have to look at the people's or the victim especially uh, one of the victims in this case of her lifestyle and other things that were going on in this um, house. So what we may see from the outside to end people's lives is a lot different to what's really going on personally with them. So I don't mean any disrespect. Also because this case is now being looked into and it's, it was announced in March of this year um, and we're in March now, I think the 21st censor day in, in the UK, so remember to do that. Um, and on the 12th of March it was announced that the, in 2021 that this case would now have to be looked into in this independent review of this case because it's such an unsafe case. If it wasn't an unsafe case, there wouldn't have been two trials in this case already. That should have been it over with. There should be nothing else about this case that we should have to discuss apart from the facts of the case as they were. That's not the case here at all. A man could have been, and by the evidence, you know, um, there's, there's lots of issues around this case, uh, that it could have been a miscarriage of justice. So it's a really important case, and when you speak about a case that you think is a miscarriage of justice, or they think there's a miscarriage of justice enough that they would open up this independent review to look at the facts of this case, the full facts of this case, all over again. Um, it's important that we, 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 we tell it honestly and truthfully and so I don't mean any disrespect of anything I'm going to say throughout this video. It's just facts or the facts as we know them or we would assume them to be. Um, it's very difficult in this case, there's lots of individuals in this case. When I speak about these people in this case I also am not saying that they are the murderers or whatever. We don't know. I'm telling you about what's happened throughout this case um, and so there's that you know and I really feel for the family of these victims I really do the ones that's left I really do feel for them 
because this case has never gone away. But there's a reason why this has never gone away. And until really we have this independent review, and this independent review has to be so transparent, really, that there is a conclusion to this case. One, to give the victim's family some, you know, release from this so they can move on. And, and I think this is why this has to be done. Plus, there's many reasons why I, I get really rolled up about miscarriages of justice. Because this case was a horrific murder, a massacre of people, of four people, including two children. If this man didn't do it, if it and there isn't a lot of evidence or any evidence to say this man done it, if he didn't do it, then the person that done it is still out there and has been for all these years. While an innocent man could have been put in prison for this, the that perpetrator is still out there. You have now took away the liberty of someone that's done nothing wrong. You've allowed a perpetrator that can commit such crime as this to roam free amongst us. The cost of not one trial in this case, and then, not set, and then the second trial, and now an independent review into the South Wales Police, because this is a Welsh case. You know, it's shocking, really. It should never have got this far. If the police had done their job right in the first place, this should not be questionable. If you don't know, or you haven't got the evidence to put someone up for a murder, to have them charged with a murder, with strong enough evidence that this case can never ever be questioned, then you shouldn't have charged that man with murder. You can't have it always. The law is there. We talk about on this channel law and justice, don't we? Truth and justice. Well, where's the truth? If we're setting up people to be put into prison and there's an, an, an unsafe conviction here, where's the truth? And I think if we don't have evidence, whether this man killed him, her or not, these people or not, if there's not enough evidence to prove it, to hold up in court, this is going to be the outcome where you're going to continually have people questioning this conviction. And that's not right. It's not right on the public purse, it's not right on the victim's family, and it's not right on the person that may have been innocent of a crime. And so this is why I really wanted to do this case and try and do it where I show you the evidence of what was used to convict this man and leave this up to you to decide what you think. Because really it comes down in the end to public opinion. Because this man, David Morris, or Di Morris, this has been going on, and uh, you know, this, this is going out in steam now, this is really speeding up now. The people, his children, his family, that have fought for 20 years, to, and have said for 20 years, this man didn't do it. So I think we owe him that, and we owe the victim's family that, and we owe the victims themselves to get the right person for these crimes. Not the people that the police want to think done it. You can't, you can assume anything, but you have to be able to prove it. And in this day and age, and even in 1999, when this case happened, 27th of June, 1999, we had DNA. We had evidence. And they should have gathered all that evidence. And if there wasn't enough evidence, then you can't prosecute because this is where you've left us now, 20 years later. Lots of money are now going to have to go into this. And because the New you know, South Wales Police have had many issues with miscarriages of justice, this also is on their record. So again, this could mean why people think this is an unsafe conviction because of everything else that's happened within the South Wales Police over the years. And there's been many of them. You've had the Cardiff Five, or I suppose if you may know it, the Cardiff Three. Um, you've had Phil Skipper, who was um, convicted of his wife's murder. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. So, uh, But there's many, many more. There's too many. I could actually do a case on just the miscarriages of justice or the unsafe cases that have had to... And people have gone to prison. People have lost their liberty, their livelihoods through this, through these South Wales police 
that have just seemed to be you know thinking you know in their mind this is the person that's done this and this is what you know they're they're focused on this it's tunnel vision they can't have tunnel vision when you're investigating a crime you have to look you have to see where the evidence takes you you can't make it up you can't presume anything it's either fact or it's not and that's what why miscarriages of justice really really annoy me but they mainly really worry me because if this man didn't do this there is a serious criminal out there there's a serious psychopath out there that's still walking around so this murder is the Clydex murders it's um, Swansea it's like a uh, little valley in Swansea uh, so it's a Welsh case and it's 1999 I think 26 and 27th of June in the early hours of that morning 1999 the victims were Doris uh, Dawson, 80 year old, she was, um, had a disability, she had disabilities and she was an invalid and she was 18, she was living with her daughter uh, Mandy Powell who was 34 at the time of her uh, death um, and also she was living with her two granddaughters and their names were Katie and she was 10 and Emily who was 8 at the time of their death. So this is a tragic murder, okay, so now they, the police believe that Doris who was very well liked, an 80 year old disabled woman was laying in bed, um, Mandy and the children were out babysitting for somebody else, uh, they got home I think about quarter to twelve time, but we'll start off with Doris, now Doris was in bed, in her bedroom, probably asleep, it looks like she died where she laid, um, I think a neighbour did hear though, a car pull up, Time is, is a bit sketchy, but they heard a car pull up and then the light in the home go on that evening. So we don't really know what time, we're only speculating on what time that Doris um, was murdered. So then we have Doris laying in her bed and the perpetrator has come into her bedroom. He has used a, um, a, a metal pole, but not a heavy metal pole. It's a metal pole, but it's not really heavy. It's not what you'd think, like a metal pole, that, but the damage this person done with this pole, he smashed her face in to pieces, and as he come up and continued to hit and hit and hit her, he hit the light bulb, and he knocked the electric out, because once he hit the light bulb, it took the power out of the house. So what this man done was, we don't know then if Doris was dead or dying on this bed, but he left her in that bedroom. He then went to the children's bedroom and in the children's bedroom in the corner was a chair just an ordinary chair and on that chair there was a TV he removed the TV from the bed and he put it uh, from the chair and put it on the bed he then took the chair downstairs he found where the um, fuse box was for the electric he placed the chair he stood on the chair and he then fixed the electrics so and waited so we know he had already attacked Doris and he was there quite a while because he took the chair down, fixed the electric, done all this. The mindset of this killer, you've just killed someone or you're killing someone, she's dying or dead. Smash this person to pieces, her head and her skull with a metal pole. You've took this chair, you fixed the electric because you want Mandy to think everything's okay, don't you? And she comes back in the door with her two children. And then this man lays and waits. And I think when Mandy arrived home at, I think quarter to 12 time, quarter to 10 to 12, that's when they think she come back from the babysitting with, with her two children. We know they had gone upstairs because Mandy was first attacked in her bedroom. And then she was also attacked in the children's room and then she was finally killed in her mother's bedroom and found on that floor. We know that one of the children, the youngest girl, was found dead in her bedroom. We also know that the 10 year old, I think it was Katie, was found in the hallway and again they both all had, all three, have had their heads really smashed in. Um, I think Katie who was in the hallway her brain, they know that her brain was exposed 
where the damage he had and that the metal pole had been prodded into that brain. So this perpetrator is somebody that can not only kill women but can kill children. Had no fear of it. He had no fear of getting caught. He didn't run. He, most perpetrators, when they're killing something and something goes wrong, like the electrics go or whatever, he would have gone. Most of them would have gone. That would have been enough to stop a perpetrator in their tracks and think, oh my gosh, hang on a minute. You know, one, because there's more evidence, he could have glass on him, he could have cut him, anything, he could have, you know, anything. Let alone go to another room, take a chair from that room downstairs, fix the electric and sit and wait for your next victim. So we now know, don't we, that the others really were just collateral damage. And I hate to say that word, really, I do. But it's true. The actual prime victim here was Mandy Powell. That's who this perpetrator wanted. And we can tell that by what he did to her after he killed her. He then ran a bath, you see. Again, not rushing to leave this home. He placed her in that bath with washed up. So you're talking about someone with some strength. We already know he must have had strength because of the metal bar. It wasn't that heavy, but it created a lot of damage by the sheer force that they used to hit these people with. We now know that you can lift a dead body weight up or drag a dead body weight up, place it in a bath, wash that body, and then take that body back, lay that body out in a position and I'm going to have to say it, where she was posed, she was totally naked, washed, her head smashed in, and then he inserted a sex toy into her vagina area and left it. He then placed a watch on her wrist, a man's watch on her wrist, and placed her there so he's posed his body. Every part of this man, this criminal, this perpetrator, you can analyse. Why take the time? Why take the risk? Now Mandy's house was a corner house, so it was either terraced or it was semi-detached. She had a neighbour. The risk you're taking to kill four people and then to stay in wait after you've killed one, to stay in wait for the next ones to come home, your target that you're after, you've waited. And he probably waited in Mandy's bedroom for her. That's probably where the first attack happened for her. But then, you then bathe her. You then take time to pose her. Insert things into her body. This wasn't about sex, this murder. This was about humiliation. This was about control. Why place a man's watch on her arm? Why would you do it? Because we know it wasn't Mandy's. We know no one in that house had a watch like that. Everything this perpetrator has done, he's trying to tell you something, or he's trying to tell her something. He's trying to humiliate her. What is he saying by putting this man's watch on? We don't know, but there was a reason for it. Everything that was going through this perpetrator's mind, there was a reason for, and he was in no rush at all. No rush. So when we hear the neighbour heard a car pull up and someone get out and put the light on into Mandy's and there was no car on the drive, so was he dropped off? Was this person dropped off? We don't know. Again, because really when this perpetrator then left this home he set about four fires all around the place to try and disguise the evidence. He wanted Mandy to be found. He wanted her to be humiliated. He could have burnt that house to the ground. He didn't. He'd done enough damage, I suppose, to where the fire brigade were called to make it look, I think he maybe he was hoping that's what would have happened. But the major fire was not upstairs, really where he'd killed these people. It was in the kitchen. And he started the main one in the kitchen. Little fires, four of them, but the main one was in the kitchen. So we now have these neighbours now, call in, you know, the fire service, you know, because they see a fire. You have neighbours, you can see this house on fire or the kitchen on fire, smoking, 
Um, so they've called them and the fire brigade have come. Of course they have, there's a fire. No one's realised in here that this was an arson. No one's realised at this point, and nor would they realise, as far as they're concerned, it's an accidental fire. Probably started in the kitchen. Well, even electrical fires start in kitchens. And so the fire brigade have done their job. They then put out this fire, and as they put out this fire, the fire brigade have had to go in there, and they found bodies. They found, you know, um, <laughs> the first body they found was a 10-year-old in the hallway. Now, you'd think she was trying to get out, wouldn't you? So you can't blame the fire brigade for causing any damage to the evidence. They didn't know there was evidence, and if they hadn't put out that fire, there would have been less evidence than there was already. So they did their job, and as they was taking these bodies out, I think they found the kids first, and they took them out and laid them out on the grass in the um, in the garden, and they also then took out Mandy's body. But as they was taking them out and trying to work on them because they thought they had smoking inhalation damage, they realised especially by the time that Mandy's body was brought out. Hang on a minute, there's issues here. These people's heads are smashed in. Mandy's come out and carried out with the sex toy still inserted in her, naked, with her head and face smashed in. The body of Doris, by that stage, was still upstairs in her bed. They hadn't found her body yet. Um, so then they knew there was issues. Now this is where this case starts to take a turn to where you could say this is where this case starts to become unsafe for a real prosecution here. So we have this now a crime scene. So when there's fire brigade and ambulance there's also the police now being called isn't there? So we know now that this is now a first a fire, the people where it was a fire in the fire brigade and then the ambulance come and they take the bodies out and then it's realised that there is an actual, this is now a crime scene. This is a murder arson scene. We had now this police officer that was there at the crime scene and his name was um, Stuart Lewis. Now Stuart Lewis at the time was an acting inspector. So you would, you would assume, wouldn't you, you're acting inspector, you want to now show that you can do your job and you're going to do it correctly. He was at this St. crime scene for about 10 minutes only. Even though he knew this was a crime scene now, the ambulance people, ambulance officers have said, the fire brigade have said, they all know it. Now everyone steps away from these bodies because they know something's happened. Also now the house becomes a crime scene, doesn't it? But you see, Stuart Lewis did not protect that crime scene. He didn't secure it. Actually didn't tell anybody it was a murder scene at all. I think he was there about 10 minutes. He went back to his station and he mentioned to nobody that four people, including two children, had been murdered. No one. Then he loses his pocketbook or his logbook. I mean, <laughs> listen, gross misconduct anyway. Straight away for this man. You're a police officer. You're the first one at the scene. You're there. You don't secure a crime scene. Why? Why wouldn't you secure a crime scene? You want to contain that evidence as best you can, can't you? That's what most police officers would do. That's what the investigators, what I know, would do. But then you go back to your police station like nothing's happened. You don't tell someone. You don't do anything about starting a criminal investigation into the murders of four people. You do nothing. You lose your book, your logbook on that night. That should have described your details, where you'd been, what you'd been doing. That was lost. So that's suspicious anyway. It really is. There's some suspicion there and that's where I believe this case then fell apart from that minute. There was things in this case then that was anything after that really fell apart. This case was never safe. The minute you do not secure a site crime scene, the minute you have a police officer that then loses evidence 
or doesn't protect evidence and then you find out that this person or the, the brother of this person, the twin brother of this person is married to a woman called Alison Lewis and she was in a homosexual relationship with Mandy Powell and that's the issue here that I don't think anybody can get over. I think this is what's opened this whole thing for years. Two trials have been in this case, and we'll go through them in a minute. You, there's issues here which makes this look like a cover-up, and it may not have been, but what you've done by doing this, by losing your logbook, by not reporting that it's a crime, by not securing a crime scene, you've incriminated yourself, really, haven't you? And in the end, I think three of these, these people, Alison um, Lewis, her husband, um, Stephen Lewis, and his brother, um, Stuart Lewis. Now, Alison and Stephen, this married couple, was arrested under suspicion of the murder. And I think uh, Stuart Lewis was also arrested at one point for um, preventing the course of justice. So listen, there was issues here. But then we have to think about now, what else is in this case as evidence? What could be used as evidence? We had eyewitness testimony of somebody on from that night. So you had this taxi driver that was driving down, I think, Further Road. Um, it was a short walk, actually, from Kelvin, Kelvin Road, where these murders took place. And this was between 2 a.m. and 2.30 a.m when he noticed two men walking down the street um, or the, along the pavement at that point. And he said it's, it, it, it's, it struck him that they were very, very similar, these people, very, very similar in look. Uh, and he said both had dark cropped hair. Um, when he heard about the murders the next day, he did say that he called the police to tell them about it, but no one bothered to return his calls at all. He said, you know, they took his details, he told them, they said they wrote it down, if they took his details, they said that they'd get someone on to him, but no one ever called him back. No one. It was like, it didn't matter. No one wanted to know. Two weeks later, the driver says that he called the police again to say, you know, that he hadn't seen, he'd seen these men, and again, that no one had called him back, and he said he knew the identity of these people because he'd seen these two people um, on this um, police, you know, when they were um, charged for um, a suspicion of murder. And he said he had identified them as Stuart and um, Stephen Lewis. Uh, but again, um, that wasn't then taken into account. And again, this man was never called to even give evidence. He was never called to give evidence. He specifically said he was 100% and he rang the next day after the murder. This isn't someone that's rung up a year later or two years later or three years later. He rang the day after the murder, described these people and was never spoken to. His evidence was never took seriously, even though there was another witness that did see the person very, very closely. So on the night of the murder, I think it was Nicola Williams. Now she was driving in Gellion Road uh, in the early hours of the 27th. So we knew that the murders that took place either early hours of Saturday morning into early hours of Sunday morning um, on June 1999 and she also thinks that she saw Stephen Lewis near Kelvin Road at around 2.30 a.m. This woman pulled up to somebody. She pulled up because this man was walking home. My God, I don't know how she would have done it. I would have never done it. We're talking about 1999 I suppose in these villages that, that's what you do but I'm telling you in London you'd never be pulling up to anyone. So she stopped her car thinking maybe he needed help and she looked at him directly in the eye. She looked at him. She saw him. Because you know with me, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the great, with the greatest with eyewitness testimonies. It depends how it is. It depends how quick you've seen him for. Again, what the light was like. But she says she's pulled up. She was going to offer this person a lift. She wanted to know if they was okay. And she described this person. And then she went to the police station and she'd done an e-fit of this person, an e-fit of him, described him 
Then she picked this man out in a lineup. The same man. And when you look at her refit, and I'll be putting them both up, you make up your mind who you think she saw that night. But again, her evidence was discarded again. And the e-fit that she did, and then she even where she had the lot in the lineup where she chose someone out of a lineup, that e-fit was never put out to the public. So we have to ask ourselves again, why? Why wasn't it? Because the e-fit that she put up was very similar to the Lewis brothers. Actually, <laughs> more than similar. But again, you can't rely on just that. Because a lot of people, and we've had this, haven't we, when we talk about you know, um, other crimes that we've done, where people have said they look like that, and they're so sure it was them, and, the, and some people look so alike. And, um, you know, Napa case has got that, where it was the wrong identity. So you can't discard somebody else. You can't think just because this looks like someone. And then she described what they were wearing. They, she said it's like a bomber jacket, a black jacket, looked like a police, an old police jacket. That's how she described what the person was wearing, carrying stuff under his arm. So, listen, I'm not saying that these people did it because they was actually, when they was under suspicion of murder and, you know, preventing the course of justice, they was let off with um, insufficient evidence because there is insufficient evidence in this because the crime scene was one damaged by the perpetrator. The crime scene was left unattended, not reported until the Monday lost his pocketbook, did nothing to secure this home. So when you're talking about evidence and the reliance of evidence, then there is none, really. Now also in this evidence or in this home that they'd found, there was a gold chain. And the gold chain was a distinctive gold chain and it had a break in it where the um, the person had put in, and I think they said it was Dave Morris's, where he'd put in a silver uh, link chain to hold it together. But my issue when you find a gold chain and you have got no other forensic evidence on that, only, only part of DNA that was on that was Mandy Powell's. That's the only part of the chain that had any DNA on it that was hers. And that was found in the mother's room on the floor covered in blood. Uh, and that's one of the things that they put against him. Now, you know, as I've said about David Morris before, he is, um, he was charged with this murder because of all this evidence. He was first looked at, I think, after this part of this evidence with the Lewis brothers and, and that fell apart. But I think before we actually go on to the real case of David Morris, I think we need to look at the background of Mandy Powell, because I've just said that Mandy Powell was in her, a relationship, a sexual relationship, with Alison Lewis, the wife of one of the police officers. Now, um, I think Stephen Lewis was a police officer in another town, um, but Stuart Lewis, this acting inspector, was the police officer in Clyditch at that time of that murder. So this makes these three very relevant. Now, uh, I don't, I've said before, I don't like to speak ill of the dead, I don't, but I think when you're looking at a case and you're looking at a miscarriage of or, or potential miscarriage of justice case, you have to then look at the lifestyles of people. Now we know from Alison Lewis's statement that she was sleeping next to her husband, so she says on the night of, of the murder, he was, she was with him all night. That also then tells us that she was in a relationship, a loving sexual relationship with her husband at the same time as being in a sexual relationship with Mandy Powell. We know that um, because really she stated it. She says that Mandy Powell, you know, they were in love. But you see, Mandy Powell isn't here anymore, is she? Mandy Powell's murdered, as was her two children and her mother. So again, it's only hearsay. And the prosecution, of course, want you to believe. They really want you and they want to portray an image 
of Mandy and of um, Alison um, of this loving relationship but was it such an intense loving relationship and I think Alison says they had sex that morning not once not twice but three times really but that's you saying that and the thing is with the sex toy that was inserted into Mandy Powell uh, when she was taken out of the um, home after her death the only DNA that was on that sex toy was that of Alison that's the only real DNA that was found there now listen DNA when you're talking about sex toys and stuff like that and I think it was vaginal um, DNA as well maybe they hadn't washed maybe they haven't washed the sex toy you don't know we don't know but that was the only DNA found on it I don't think that's enough evidence to say that she had done anything but there's other issues going on here and I want to get back to this relationship about Mandy and Alison because when someone is deceased it's very easy to say all these sort of things isn't it that we were in this loving relationship well this was a secret relationship it was an affair you're saying that your husband didn't know he said he didn't know you was in this relationship you have Mandy Powell also at this time we know that she had already slept with or had a relations with Di Morris or David Morris um, because he said it and she had told other people but I don't know how this relationship was this loving uh, as, as Alison wants to come across with you see um, Mandy she had said to people and including Alison that she had cancer and she would get Alison to drop her off at appointments you know the hospital for this cancer well Mandy Powell never had cancer so what was Mandy Powell up to was is it because she wanted time away maybe from Alison because they seem to spend every minute together and as Alan says and said to you on that morning you know the morning before she died she had slept with her three times you know how much of a willing participant was Mandy in this did she really want it was this all what was it was meant to look like because why would Mandy Powell lie about having cancer and get this woman to drop her off at her appointments was it to give her a break was she seeing somebody else would this now bring in some other potential suspect into this relationship it could do did she know because Mandy was um, because Alison was married that maybe she was frustrated and thought if I pretend to be ill Mandy may uh, Alison may leave her husband and come to me you don't know you see we don't know what's going on in Mandy Powell's mind at the time but something was to lie to say you have cancer something was going on and that's a real potential issue here that we have to look at in this case because you know you've been murdered now so everything that Mandy Powell did or said or her behaviour that was different to normal and this was different to her normal she was a nurse by trade you know why was she lying why did she lie and there, there's these people this happy relationship between Alison then and Mandy once Alison found out about this and it was only a few months before that it was all over I mean the, the woman was absolutely heartbroken she said she couldn't believe what Mandy had said she felt used and, and stuff I think I think Alison Lewis felt more about this relationship more than Mandy did and I think I, Alison then realised that when she um, found that out so can you believe and I'm saying this in the nicest possible way can you believe Alison Lewis a woman that was having an affair anyway a woman that is telling you this was this great loving relationship and you've got the prosecution pushing to you that this was a loving honest open relationship no it wasn't honest and open they were having an affair people were lied to some people don't like being lied to they just don't and so anyone in this whole scenario here even people we don't know of because we don't know who else Mandy was seeing are potential suspects in this case I don't think this part of Mandy's life 
was looked into enough. I really don't. This should have gone wider. This is there's reasons here. If um, Alison's husband, Stephen, didn't know about the affair, that would eliminate him, wouldn't it? She was only at a barbecue a couple of days before she was married. We also know that a couple of weeks before that, that Stephen Lewis had gone up to her door and was screaming at Mandy about keep away from my wife. But we don't know if he was screaming at Mandy because of the harm she had caused Alison, the distress she had caused Alison by lying about having cancer, do we? We don't know. Or is it because he knew about the affair or found out about the affair and was that pissed off? He's gone to her and told her in no uncertain terms, keep away from my wife. We don't know. We don't know because Mandy's not here to tell us nor is any of her family here to tell us that what happened. But I think what brings these people into this murder or under suspicion of murder was the actions of the brother, the police officer, the investigating officer at that time. That's what brought them into this. And because there was no evidence or not enough evidence then to do anything, they were released. Now, Alison, a few days after um, Mandy Powell's murder, tried to commit suicide by jumping out of her um, bedroom window. She wanted to say, she said she wanted to be with Mandy. So listen, I don't know, and I'm not saying that these people did it, and I'm not saying they didn't. I'm saying we don't know. But then, if we can say that about them, because they're police officers and everything we know about them, what makes now <laughs> someone like David Morris or Di Morris, the prime suspect here. What changed it from this? What's the difference? What's the evidence? Let's have a look at that. Okay, let's look at Di Morris or David Morris. Now, it is said or written or however you want to put it, this is not my words, these are other people's words because I don't know this man at all. I think I'd like to meet him though and interview him so if any of his family are interested please let me know. So they are saying, the police are saying and the prosecution and all this are saying that Di Morris was a violent thug with a strong history of domestic violence towards women. Okay, that's fine if that's, that's the case then that's what he was but that does not make him a murderer, does it? Um, at the time of the murder, David Morris was living with a woman called Mandy Jewell. Now, Mandy Jewell, here we go again with another link. Mandy Jewell and Mandy Powell were friends. They were friends. Now, also, <laughs> David Morris had said that he'd already had an affair or was sleeping with or having relations with Mandy Powell. He also didn't like the relationship between his girlfriend, then girlfriend Mandy Jewell, because um, I, I don't know why, that he just didn't want the relationship, uh, them two relationships to get together. Listen, people can be funny. If this man wanted to sleep with Mandy Powell, he wouldn't have wanted these two to be friends, would he? If he'd already had relationships with Mandy Powell, he wouldn't have wanted these two people to be friends. Or if he wanted to sleep, or was sleeping with her even at that point, he wouldn't have wanted his girlfriend, then girlfriend, Julie, um, uh, um, Mandy pa uh, Jewel to be anywhere near this girl, would he? Because people don't want to get caught. If they're having an affair, they don't want to get caught. Now don't forget, we've also had the affair that Mandy was having with now with um, Angela. So, oh, Alison, sorry. So there's a lot going on in this case. This, I mean, this widens open this case now to other potential suspects and things that were going on. Now in this point, um, David Morris had said, things about uh, Mandy, he had said things uh, about Mandy Powell, uh, derogatory things, he couldn't stand her and stuff, but this could have been a ruse, couldn't it? This could have been where he was trying to not show that he liked or was having relationships with her, because people lie all the time. Now, it said, or it has been said, that Mandy was frightened of him. She didn't like him. She thought he was a bit overpowered and she was scared of him. But Mandy is not here to give them accounts. Again, it's hearsay. No one in Mandy's home is alive, are they, to give the actual account of what's happened here. So again, 
It's unreliable evidence. It's hearsay, really. It cannot be proven in court at all. So really, whatever they say about David Morris and um, you know Mandy Powell's relationship or how she felt about him, they can't prove it. No one knows. So he was in this pub on this night. Um, he was drinking. He says he had about eight pints of beer. So he's admitting, okay, he drunk eight pints of beer. And I think he was in this uh, new inn pub. And a, witch, a witness said that he left about um, 23.30, so 11.30 p.m. at night. Um, uh, the prosecution also tried to say that he took amphetamines. I mean, this is unfounded. Um, for one, he wasn't arrested anywhere time near this time. So for them to say that um, Di Morris or, or David Morris has always denied them allegations that he took um, any and vitamins and, uh, at all, any drugs at all that would have been, um, done anything. But he did say he had about eight pints of beer. He was intoxicated. Um, he'd had a row, I think, early on in the, in the pub in, that, in the evening with his girlfriend then, Mandy Jewell. She had left and then he started to walk home, they say, about 11.30 when he left his pub. Um, now, what, the, what the, um, the prosecution want you to believe is that this man, this intoxicated state, was walking through this um, um, sort of, I don't know if you've ever been to Wales, but I wouldn't walk anywhere in Wales because you know, hilly, especially when you're in a valley. Um, but he, they said he did, they said it was about 15 minutes um, away around the corner from Kelvin Road. You've got a man now who's intoxicated, they said he's walked there, he's then committed all these murders because at that time, um, really, they believe, I think, that um, the, even the mother was killed at the same time. That's not true actually it's impossible and by the evidence now it can sh it shows that that she was uh, murdered first and the reason we know that is because of the the light that was damaged the electric box that was fixed and also the blood spatter so when you've had the chair removed and the tv removed um from the bedroom um the blood spatter was only on that it wasn't on the chair at all so there was the, the ways they can tell of when it happened what happened and how it looked and there was no blood spatter on that chair, so the chair was not in that room at the time of their murders. So, did did um, David Morris have time in his intoxicated state? And even if he had took um, extra drugs or whatever, it, it would have been worse. But he denies it, it; it wasn't. But could he have walked to the um, Mandy Powell's home and killed them all in that short time in his intoxicated state? Could then he have changed the, as he blew the electricity, could he then have rewired the house? Why would he have? Why would you have if you've been there anyway and you've done your thing? Could he have done that? Would he have had time to do that, get to there? Because we know Mandy didn't get in to about quarter to 10 to 12. Did he have time? He only left this pub about 11.30 time and it would have took 15 minutes at least to walk if he was in a normal state, probably more to walk if he was in an intoxicated state. You know, Wales is not the easiest place to walk around. Plus, though, we are now discarding the evidence or the or so-called evidence which was not admissible, really, about this car that had driven up um, earlier on in the evening and then the light was switched on then. It couldn't have been David Morris because David Morris was in this new inn pub at the time with many, many people. So it's like the police have discarded that bit because that doesn't fit their tunnelled vision. So then we have David Morris and this prosecution saying that this is what he's done. He's then, um, you know, killed all these people. He's um, then washed this body. He's then, you know, done this section, this body out and put it on show as if to humiliate her. He's put a watch on her. Where did the watch come from? Because it wasn't David's at all. So where did the watch come from? There was a chain found there, a gold chain found there. And David Morris did have a gold chain, and that chain was lost um, some while ago. And the chain was a distinctive chain, and it was this chain that had the gold little loop, on, a little silver loop that someone else had put on it. Um, he'd put on it, but as I've said before, the chain only had the DNA of um, Mandy Powell on it. It didn't have the DNA of him. Yes, it was found in the mother's bedroom, in the grandmother's bedroom, um, on the floor where she died, covered in blood. But he did have relations with her. He was having a relationship at some point with Mandy. 
at any point this chain could have been left there, dropped off. You've already heard, haven't we, from Alison that she had sex three times that morning with Mandy Powell. This emotional, you know, adventurous sex. Well, maybe that's what Mandy Powell was into. And maybe this is where then Di Morris had lost these um, chain. He did. He could have. I don't think actually he even thought about the chain until it started being mentioned about being found as evidence and being put out on the TV as this specific um, chain, um, gold chain that was found. And I think Di Morris, to tell you the truth, or David Morris, got very worried that he was going to be fitted up for this murder. Listen, I think with David Morris, and we have to be quite clear about it, is that you're talking about someone that had a muddled story. One, he was intoxicated. He said he was going to walk to his mother's and then he was going to walk to the girlfriend's and, you know, and then he finally got home to the girlfriend and we'll read her statement in a little while about what she says when he got home. I think with Di Morris, where it comes to this evidence of this necklace, this gold chain that was left there, if he had said he'd never had relations with her or if it wasn't known that he had had relations with her, then of course the gold chain would have been of much more relevance than what it was then because he could have left that gold chain in that property at any time, could have fell off and lost it, he's lost it. You know, he could have said to Mandy at some point, I think I've lost my chain, maybe she thought, well, I'll give it next time I see you. You don't know. They didn't even have his DNA on it, you see. So she washed it, cleaned it up, kept it, put it away, it had her DNA on it. But because David Morris started then to try and lie. He tried to lie his way out of why this. He even said, I think, to his nephew or his cousin, oh no, it's not my chain, I didn't have a chain like that. And they said, but you did. You know, you did have a chain like that. And you did. He tried to start lying his way out because I think he thought, they're going to fit me up for this. Or he could have thought, I'm going to be caught for this murder because he actually did it. So I'm not saying either way here. I'm saying this could have been, this is in hindsight, this is in theories of what could have happened. Because people, you see, when they are under suspicion of something, by per police officers or by police forces, well known at that time for miscarriages of justice, for interrogating people, you know, not in the best way, to be putting evidence across. Now people have already known, hadn't they, that the police officers and the girlfriend of Mandy and the, you know, the husband of her were automatically eliminated, weren't they, from this inquiry quite early on. They were charged with suspect, you know, being suspicion of, of murder, but they weren't charged with anything really, were they? They were, no, there was no evidence against them, they were let go. So now they're looking for somebody else and now all of a sudden Di Morris then starts being looked at. We also then have a police officer that doesn't know Di Morris, he was an off-duty police officer, this is what's been said, um, that heard a conversation that um, of how um, David Morris was speaking about Mandy Powell and how he wanted to kill her and stuff. You know, it's hearsay. This is all hearsay. This is all circumstantial evidence. I mean, this could have been anyone talking about Mandy, couldn't it? Or they may not have talked about her at all. Then I hear other evidences when he was being questioned, when not when he was being questioned, but when he was arrested, and his the on duty solicitor or um, you know the person you know that, that comes in to talk to you, um, usually it's the on duty solicitor, um, will come in and you are that's a privileged conversation. Then you go into a separate room with no police officers, no tape recordings, no nothing and you would usually then sit there and you talk to your client about, first of all, the process, because you don't know them, you've never met them. This is the first time you've ever spoke to these people. So you, it takes a good 10, 15 minutes, and to tell you the truth, I mean, let's be honest here, you know, we all know there's no money in criminal law, and these on-duty um, solicitors, these police station reps, they don't get a lot of money, so you're not rushing here, all right? Let's be honest, there's no lawyer going to tell you they're rushing 
here when it comes to criminal law. There's a process here that has to be done. You would speak to David Murray about you, your firm, what you can do, what they've got, you know, the process of what's going to happen before you actually even speak about the crime itself or the crime he's been charged with himself. But you, what you certainly wouldn't expect is that when you're in a police station and you're having a confidential conversation with your client, that a police officer would then turn on the recording equipment and record you, but only to say, sorry, it was by accident, I was just testing the room. And then to falsify the times on that statement that they've made, thinking that if they say it's a bit later, that you're going to be caught out. None of that evidence should have been admissible in court. That was absolutely evidence that was falsified. It was absolutely privileged information. I don't know what the police officers were doing. I really don't. I really don't. So all this stuff makes me really angry because you know there's a system here. You know there's a system between the client and the um, and the the, the 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 person that is there to protect that person's right. You cannot take away someone's rights because you want to fit them up for a crime. You really can't. And then to try and use that evidence in court is absolutely disgraceful, it's disgraceful, really. Because you shouldn't need to be doing that. You shouldn't need to be. Now, David Morris has never, ever admitted doing this crime to anybody. To anybody. Certainly not to the on-duty solicitor at that time. He didn't at all. He's never said that he's committed this crime. Actually, for the past 20 years, all he said is, I have not done this crime. So then we have to look at this other evidence. So then we have this chain, don't we, that they've said. So we've said about the chain, no DNA evidence of David Morris on it at all. Then we've had a sock that they found in this house as well at this time. Again, I keep saying about forensic evidence. So what they did, they tested the, the sock because they believed that the killer took it off or used that sock as on that bar to hurt them people and kill them people. So he used it to stop putting fingerprints there. So it was DNA, but what they didn't do was they DNA the outside of the sock. They didn't DNA the inside. They need to do that, and that's I think what's going to come soon. When we add up this evidence, where was the watch? Where did the watch come from? David Morris didn't have a watch. Where's the watch come from that was left on the arm of a woman that was murdered? Did he have enough time to get from this pub and do these murders? Was he compass enough to do these murders, to fix the electrics, to replace the electrics? To sit and wait because this is what the prosecution want you to believe they want you to believe that he was enraged with Mandy he wanted to have sex with Ray, with Mandy that's what he wanted he'd already had sex with Mandy he'd already had it and even if he wanted to have sex that night he wouldn't have had to kill her to do it they'd already done it so the people that are saying this is what the prosecution is trying to tell you they're trying to say to you this is our evidence against David Morris. Circumstantial evidence. There is no forensic evidence at all that links him to this crime at all. None. So without the forensic evidence, and there would have been, this man would have been covered in blood. He would have been covered in blood. No one saw a witness, no witnesses anywhere saw anyone who resembled at all David Morris in that vicinity. They saw two people and some saw one person that resembled these brothers. That's who they saw. There was no eyewitness that has seen David Morris at all. Not one. Not one. So they have this, now this, the prosecution's job is to portray to the people, and in both these cases, and there's been two trials here, we'll get back to these trials, of David Morris for this murder. On the second trial, they used the same evidence as the first. So they've swayed the jury with this evidence. They've took out evidence. They've, used, they've also used 
this public interest immunity or PLL to only um, is to withhold evidence that the prosecution have for the defence. They've withheld it. They've withheld so much evidence. Why? Now listen, you can always withhold little bits of evidence under this. Of course you can. Okay? Of course you can. But the amount of evidence that they've withheld, it's, it's so unusual. Really, it's nev I've never seen anything like it. So I think if this investigation or this you know, inquiry now is going to look into this, we need to look into that as well. What is in that information that they've got, this public interest immunity to withhold back um, evidence from the defence? We need to see what's in that. People need to know. Now, there may be evidence that may help incriminate David Morris. There may be. You don't know. Or there may be stuff that's going to help, you know, um, eliminate him. I wouldn't have thought that there's going to be stuff in this that's going to help prosecute him. To, you know, to, the university lecturer and journalist Brian Fortin is one of the founders of the Crime and Justice Research um, Centre at the University of Winchester. And he studied this kind of murders for literally, I think, over 10 years, really. He's really looked into this case. Now, he talks about the timeline. The timeline doesn't fit here for the, all the reasons that we just spoke about. The timeline doesn't fit. You know, and it's critical, really, that we understand that the first victim was Doris, the grandmother, because that takes Morris out of the equation totally, doesn't it? He wouldn't have had enough time to do all that in wait then for Mandy and his children to get home. That alone eliminates him from this crime, really. So the reason that we believe that Doris um, died first, and there's two areas to this actually, uh, and it's very confident that she died first. The first is about the murder weapon. Now the murder weapon was this pole used by, you know, the family had traces of the blood on it from Mandy and the two girls, but it didn't have any blood on it from Doris, suggesting that he used the metal bar later and removed traces of her so he cleaned that first because he was waiting he had time he cleaned it the second thing is about the light the light being took out by the swings that hit her so we know that the top lights especially would have been knocked out we know now that he had time he wouldn't have had time to do that if all four were in the home alive someone would have got out so we know now that Doris, and this is the reason why we know it, because Doris was killed first, giving him time when the rest of the house was empty to fix the electrics, to lay in wait for Mandy and her two children to come home. The timeline does not fit. It really doesn't. So when you look at all this timeline and the evidence, you've got someone intoxicated, um, someone that could do this, have the strength to do this, to, you know, to murder these people, lie in wait, fix electrics, kill three other people, bath Mandy, clean her up, put a watch on which no one knows where it came from, insert a sex toy inside her with DNA from somebody else, but you've left no DNA. Really. Let's just talk about his, his alibi, okay, for this murder. So his alibi that Morris was, had been drinking in this new inn on the edge of Clydeage and he said that he was wandering the streets for hours um, until about, um, and I think getting home about 3am, as I said before he was deciding when to go to his mother's or to back to his girlfriend's because he'd had this row with the girlfriend and when he, um, and then he claims that his girlfriend Mandy Jewell actually let him into the house. Mandy initially told the police that she had arrived home between um, half past 10 and 11 o'clock in the evening and she had, didn't let him in but we know he was in the um, park until 11.30 anyway. Um, I think that um, they, I think they relied on also with him is, is just because his alibi was a bit shifty he couldn't really remember to tell the truth and you don't know do you? We don't know what he was doing at three o'clock in the morning. We don't know whether he was at Mandy Powell's or not really and this is what this evidence hopefully this new evidence and everything else that's coming out this inquiry will show us um, about that 
Um, I think with with this new when you have DNA evidence and stuff, and I think maybe there's lots now that they could probably do more with because we have more more technology now. And we need more minute traces um, to find something, but you know there really isn't any DNA here at all. Okay, so let's sum it up. There is no DNA evidence <laughs> or fingerprint evidence linking Morris to 9 Kelvin Road at all. No. There is no witnesses that can place him near that property, in it or around it, there on that night of the murders at all. Um, the, the, the thing is with this case, it's circumstantial and I think, I don't know how this case is going to end to tell the truth, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't, because I think it was a shambles from the beginning, that you know when you have a crime scene that's not protected, when you have someone that's been charged for a crime with no evidence, um, you know, any real really, really low circumstantial evidence when you have timelines that don't fit. Um, I just, I don't know how it's going to end and I really hope that this new inquiry that they're doing, which needs to be transparent, really, to find out what really happened here, if we're ever really find out. But what this should do, this should give some, make this final, this case. Even they have evidence that Di David Morris or Di Morris did this murder. Clear, specific evidence to say that he did it. Without using all the stuff they've used and stuff to build up a prosecution's case of circumstantial evidence. And so the jury needs to be aware, I think, when any of these cases, is that there is other suspects here. Mandy had a life outside what they were told, what they knew. There's issues here. There could have been other potential suspects here that wasn't looked into. Di Morris lied, okay, to save himself from, I think, the persecution that he knew was coming. He knew it. He knew when these police officers and Alison Lewis wasn't prosecuted for that murder, who would they go for? Who would they go for? They automatically went for him because they found a chain, a gold chain. What they said was his, and he admitted in the end it was his. But not with any DNA on it at all. It could have been in that home for a very long time. Yes, David Morris is stupid because he was trying to get himself out of something that yeah, I don't think he actually did not really because the timeline doesn't fit there's stuff here that doesn't fit the person that killed these people was after Mandy they wanted to humiliate they wanted to hurt I don't know if he would have done that I don't know we don't know so let's hope this new evidence that you know all this new inquiry brings out all this evidence all the evidence that the prosecution tried to withhold whether it convicts Morris or not it needs to come out because this case needs to be finalised really finalised because what a shambles this really is and these cases are not doing South Wales Police any good at all are they and South Wales Police and I have to say it have done some great stuff you know they're called serial killers they've done some great stuff there's certain officers but people need to change the way they investigate a murder crime because you have to get it right you have to get it right early take your blinkers off stop having this tunnel vision because you assume it's someone that you try and make that evidence about them that's not how you solve a crime and I think when you look at things like Robert Napper's case and that of how People, other people can be murdered because of your lack of investigation, because your tunnel vision of someone. If there is no evidence, 
in this murder and there's no evidence that which will link um, Morris to this murder then he should be released now they're probably going to release him anyway and say that it's insufficient evidence that would leave this case open so they wouldn't class it as a miscarriage of justice they do that quite a lot because I don't think there is enough evidence here in this really to convict anybody of this murder because it started from that night when that crime scene was not secured and the failings very early on and the failings of the police to investigate this in the way it should have been investigated thoroughly took everyone into account not just always some people that may look and may act suspicious it's about people we don't know it's about the investigation that brings up other people that may have done this crime so this has been the Clydic murders we don't know innocent or guilty I leave it up to you we're going to have to wait and see I mean this inquiry has just started I mean it was advertised the 12th wasn't it of uh, 2021 12th of March 2021 we could wait a year two years to see what's going on but I'll keep you updated on this case and as I say in this case I mean no disrespect to anybody in this case I'm not saying someone did it or they didn't do it we just have to wait and see and we have to wait and see what the real evidence if there is any says about this case so thank you for watching you know what to do subscribe 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 leave your messages everything you're going to do you can follow us on Facebook and on Instagram you can also catch this case on let's have a chat about murder on Spotify so thank you for watching my partners in crime and I shall speak to you all soon. Bye-bye.